Welcome to Business Innovators Radio, featuring industry influencers and trendsetters sharing proven strategies to help you build a better life right now. It's a great day to gain some momentum. It's Lisa C. I'm doing a spotlight segment on people who are changing the game in their industry or in the lives of those they serve. This segment, I'm showcasing noteworthy women entrepreneurs and the moves they're making. Today, my guest is Karen Kaufman Wilson. Karen changes the game for young writers and directors. For the past 30 years, Karen Kaufman Wilson has worked in the film business and mentored aspiring writers and directors. Recently, she has been a consulting producer for the Bishop T.D. Jakes Film Company and is is co-producer for two Lifetime Network movies, Envy and Lust. If you're a young writer or director and want to learn from a veteran how to get in the business and make your mark, today's interview is for you. Later in the show, you'll find out how Karen helped Shonda Rhimes. Welcome to the show, Karen. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Excellent. Well, I'm always excited to interview a veteran. So let's just kind of jump in. We know you changed the game uh, for young writers and directors. What do you do and how do you change the game for them? Well, I have worked in the business as what they call a development executive. And a development executive is usually what we call, you know, your first line of defense. A script is submitted to a production company, and then the development executive reads and analyzes it and decides if it's a movie or a TV project. So I am the person that has to go to usually to my boss and fight and scream and holler and beg and plead for a project to move forward. Wow. So you you're on the front line battling to help someone's script make it absolutely make it through. And Absolutely. why is that? And if I don't think it's a project that it merits being analyzed or pursued further, then it doesn't go anywhere. Then it's what we call a pass. Then I then I pass on the project. Can you give us a couple of those merit measures, if you will? Yes. You know, the truth is, I I'm not like every I, I didn't act as a development executive like a lot of people. Because I've always had an entrepreneurial spirit, I really understand and have a tremendous amount of empathy for writers. I mean, I know how hard it is to sit. Not that I've done it, but I can understand the angst it is to sit in front of your computer for days on days, writing something that you think is important and needs to be seen. So when I open a script, I look for the yes. I want it to work. I, I'm I'm going there with full, let's make it happen. And in the first 10 pages, that's the point in which you have to sh- prove to me that it can be done. If you don't ignite my interest in the first 10 pages, I probably won't finish the script. So what what's those keys in those first 10 pages that you look for? Those um, nuggets? I don't. I'm not a big person on exposition. You don't have to spend a lot of time describing the chair that the character's sitting in. I don't need that. You grab me with either a scene that's like, oh my God, where are they? What are they doing? Oh my God. Or it's a character that you can tell has a characteristic that I've never seen before or I want to see more of. If they are deceiving somebody or if they are um, a mean, whatever they are, if they do something that I just never have seen before, it immediately captures my attention. All right. Excellent. And wow, I just want to stay in that vein for a moment. (laughs) So it's okay. (laughs) Writing is beautiful. There's nothing, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a privilege to be in a position to be able to read people's work. It's a privilege. That's excellent. How'd you get in this line of work? I came to LA after my divorce from my husband and I was a wounded little soul and didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life. Didn't I had not I had gone to college but I did not attend film school. 
A friend of mine who was in the record business said, you know, Karen, you really love reading books and then seeing if how they would look as a movie. You should be in the movie business. And I was like, what? <laughs> and so by complete happenstance, um, I met a young lady who was Eddie Murphy's assistant. And she said, you know, there's a job over at, um, at, oh my God, I can't believe his name is complete, Danny Glover's company. And he's looking for an assistant to his development executive. And I know her, I'll recommend you. Oh, I didn't know what a development executive was. I didn't wow. know. I said, oh, okay. So I interviewed with Helena and to my shock, she hired me and I literally learned on the job. I didn't know. I didn't know who Martin Scorsese was. I didn't know who Robert did. So what I did was I made these little index cards and I wrote famous directors names and then their credits on the back. Wow. And I memorized it. And it was the first time I read scripts. And I just, the good news is that I found that I had an innate um, experience with writing. I knew on some level what was working and what wasn't, but I was insanely arrogant. Like my, the first things I wrote about people's work, I cringe now. Like, <laughs> who is I? Like, wow. You, you got young some greater empathy. I know some. Huh? You developed some greater empathy. Oh, but I, that took time. That took time. I was just, full of piss and vinegar. It was ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So what was the turning point in your career that the industry saw you as, you know, a viable um, uh, script reader? I would think that when I was hired to run Carl Franklin's company, Carl Franklin had just directed Devil in a Blue Dress, and he was such a prestigious director that my being associated with him gave me a tremendous amount of credibility. And Carl is a true artiste. He is not, he is not a fly-by-night kind of director. And so it gave me a tremendous, a tremendous like viewpoint about directing and writing. And how did you get that opportunity uh, to work with him? I had been working at a very low budget production company called Trimark. I had associate produced um, a movie called Sprung that Rusty kind of directed. So I had a lot of relationships with young writers and directors. And his producing partner, Jesse, when we met, she liked that about me. She liked that I had spent a lot of time in the independent film world. And so she, and she also thought I had really good taste because I could talk about, you know, films that other people may not have watched or paid as much attention to. Mm -hmm. And she valued my opinion about that because I learned, you know, immediately that I had to be a student of film. So I watched every movie. I went to any panel about, if I, like a, there was a director, Stephen Frears, who had done Dangerous Liaisons. I went to, I sat at that panel with my mouth wide open because I thought he was such a, an incredible director, but there weren't that many people in the audience and certainly mm -hmm. nobody Black. Right. And I I didn't keep my focus on just black films. I just was a lover of all things, uh, you know, David Lynch. I mean, insane, obscure directors that people are like, Who, what? <laughs> wow. So it gave you versatility. I, and I believe, I still believe that for black people in the film business. I want us to make all kinds of movies. If we want to make Christmas movies, if we want to make thrillers, if we want to make drama, if we want to make action. I want us to do it all. I mean, that's why I sobbed during Black Panther, because I saw us doing what I always wanted us to do. Yes. Yes. Wow. So, gosh, I'm trying to figure out what direction to go in with you here. <laughs> I know um, to cover, huh? What? What is a typical day for you like? Well, now as an independent producer, I am no longer, you know, I don't, I don't have a job. So I have to generate any movement 
for my project. So for example, today before I spoke to you, um, I had to read an email from a writer I'm working with on a project called Safe Space. It's set up at Lifetime. Boris Kojo is attached to direct and we're going to start shooting it in June. And we have to turn in, she's on her, what we call her fifth step in her contract. So it's her last step. So once she writes this, it's just going to get shot. So it's got to be right. So I have to generate all the notes because I spoke to the lifetime executive yesterday, go over everything that we need to change in the script. So I am rereading all the emails that we've talked about with this project and make sure I have it on one document. And it's going to take me all day (laughs) to get this document correct. And then I will send it over to the lifetime executive. Once she signs off, then I can get my writer started. And then let's say we get that done by Tuesday and then the writer will start writing and she'll call me every few hours saying, can I send you these pages? What do you think? So it, Like that's today. Tomorrow, I need to read two or three scripts that are sitting in my inbox. Like it it changes drastically every day. Wow. Let's talk about the five steps uh, to what is it to a script or what was the. Oh, the the, the con. Okay. When when a writer is hired by a network or a studio, they have, it can be a three-step or it could be a five-step contract, but the first step is usually your first draft. And then you get two polishes, which means they just supposed to kind of fix a few things. And maybe the fourth step is what they call a production rewrite. Like we have to add some things for production value. And then the last step, and that's usually your last step. But like I can say, that can vary from three to five steps, all of those things we are at our production polish. This is it. Once we're done, we're done. I know that our listeners are, have a question in their mind. Where does the money reside? <laughs> well, <laughs> here's step? the thing. As a, from a writer's standpoint, they are paid for each step. So okay. let's say, let's just use the number 100,000. Mm-hmm. So your first step may be worth 40. Mm-hmm. Then the next step is 10. Then the next step is 10 until you reach your hundred, a whole hundred thousand. And the, the highest amount could be on that last step. But for many networks, it's the least amount of money. So let's say that the money was a hundred thousand and the mm-hmm. last step could maybe only be worth 10. Hmm. You've already been paid out 90. Okay. And the reason why you do that is because you may want to replace the writer. Wow. So if you want to replace the writer, if that last step is only 10, you can, the network or the studio could say, you know what? We only owe them 10 grand. Let's just pay them off, get a new writer. Wow. Even so though they paid out $100,000. Yeah. I mean, they, they, can't, they can't get that money back. Right. So they've already done that investment, but do they want to keep doing the investment? And that 10 is, doesn't feel so painful. Right, right. Wow, that's very valuable. Thank you. And and so while we're here, what do you consider a young writer or director? What 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 qualifies a young writer or director? Yeah, in my mind, it's usually someone, well, first of all, they're usually unproduced. They haven't their projects haven't been made. And I don't always look at it just as age. I don't think of it like you have to be young when you're in your 20s. I mean that you're just young in your you don't have as much experience as a veteran. Okay. Wonderful. So when you work with young writers and directors, how do you help them? What do you do? Well, first of all, I, I'm, like I said, I have a tremendous amount of empathy for them. So I, you kind of act as a therapist, a consultant, and you have to understand how to gently nudge them along in the process Mm -hmm. because there's points where it's incredibly frustrating. Like you'll, we've turned in drafts and the head of the network is gone. Don't like it. Start Mm -hmm. all over. Wow. And they're heartbroken. They're heartbroken and you have to allow them to be heartbroken and let them have those feelings. But I still got to get my project out of them. 
That's right. That's so I right. have to then say, okay, so look, let's 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 talk about how we can go about making this work and get them motivated again. But I think it's really important. I mean, this is just across the board in life. People have a right to be heard sure. and their feelings to be validated. So I don't, I don't. I don't act like this isn't a big deal that they're having a feeling at that moment. And sometimes during the writing process, they're having a tremendous amount of trepidation about a scene or how to get to the next scene or they, whatever it is, I always make myself available that we can talk it out. I could, you might be talking it out while I'm grocery shopping at Trader Joe's, but yes. we can talk it out, you know, or I'm at, my son's football game and walk away from the stands for a minute and we can just like hash out some ideas and get you moving on because there could be a little block going on but I just understand and always make myself available during the process. So how should a young writer or director approach you uh, to potentially work with you? One of the things that I I think that the mistake that people often make with me is I get a lot of response through LinkedIn and they'll say, would you read my script? Uh, Would you listen to my pitch? And I always say no, because my feeling is I've worked really, really hard to get my experience and my time has a tremendous amount of value. So you have to show me why I need to spend my time on you. And I often tell people, stop asking something of me, do something for me. So, for example, I have one of the films that I co-produced is airing tonight on Lifetime. It's called Lust. Now, you could watch that and you could say, huh, she's really interested in sort of interesting sexual edgy, confusing characters who are at a crossroads in their life. So then you read some article in a magazine about a woman who is struggling with sexual addiction. Let's just say it's that. Now, you just think it's an interesting article and you send it to me. You say, "I I think there's something around making this a movie. Now, I don't know if it's a movie, but the fact that you looked at my work And then thought, well, this article may appeal to her. That catches my eye. And if I read the article and I go, you know what? Maybe there is something to this. You know, Mm -hmm. maybe I could. What if I got the right director on this? What if I got the right piece? If I start that churning, then I'm going to call you. Wow. And then I'm going to say, like, we can start talking. You can say, well, I've got an idea of how we could make it. And next thing you know we could be in business together, but don't come at me asking me for something. Give me something. And right now you only have your sweat equity to trade on and use that. Mm -hmm. You can ask me something like, I don't, maybe your listeners don't know what coverage is, but coverage is the most gruesome and great tool in the film business that people don't often talk about. When a script is submitted to a production company, we give it to a reader and a reader generates coverage. And a coverage is a log line, which is one sentence to describe the story, the synopsis of the story and what they think of the writer. And if that reader says that they're terrible, then most people don't go any further. If someone who was a writer said, hey, you know what? I'm really interested in reading more scripts. I'd like to generate a piece of coverage for you and tell me what you think. You want to you read one of the 5 million scripts I, want, I have to read <laughs> for me? Right. And you're going to give me your opinion? Great. I'll send it to you. You generate me coverage. And then you, your coverage might be so interesting. I want to talk to you. Or I'll just talk to you because you did the coverage. Wow, that's valuable. Thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. So, I mean, it's no secret that the struggle is real in the TV and film industry. (laughs) Super real, super real. And you have 
uh, you have your foot in both. You yes. have this Lifetime movie, congratulations, that's Thank coming you. out today, right? And it's a two-part. Talk to us about that for a second. Um, that was an interesting project. Sean Robinson, I would, at the time I was a consulting producer for Bishop T.D. Jakes's um, film company. Sean Robinson sent the books to the gentleman I was uh, reporting to. His name is Derek Williams. Derek smartly then went to Lifetime and convinced them to give the uh, give them a three picture deal off of the idea. They had just done Faith Under Fire with Tony Braxton. It had made great numbers. Lifetime wanted to be in business with Bishop. So then he took those three books that were written by Victoria uh, Murray, set them up at Lifetime. And then he turned to me and said, OK. Get it, get it done, basically. So I developed all three books into the screenplays that they are now, hired the direct, hired the writers, you know, went through each of those steps with each writer at the same time. So there was three of them going on. (laughs) It was lust, envy, and greed. And eventually, to our surprise, Lifetime during the pandemic decided, hey, we got to make these movies and we got to make them now. So it was just the mad rush to getting get them to the finish line. So that was your 2020 pandemic time. You know, while everybody was, and look, I deeply felt for people who were suffering during 2020, but for me, it was a really, I mean, I, God really blessed me. And I am very grateful to Derek Williams and to Bishop Jakes for the opportunity. It was great. Excellent, excellent. So what would you say is different about working with you? Here's the thing. It's the good and the bad. Like I, you know, I am a very straight, no chaser kind of person. And I am not uncomfortable with us having um, a difference of opinion. In fact, I welcome it. And I think that there's a way to respectfully have a conversation where we disagree and we can come to an agreement. And then I, I don't think about that disagreement again. No perfect example. Um, I am partnered with a woman named Dominique on the project that we're doing with Boris called Safe Space. And I made a mistake and she was upset with me and she called me and she told me she was angry at me. And I said, you're right. I did it. And I'm really sorry. And I didn't. This is why I did it. I didn't think it was going to affect the production part of the process, which is why I didn't let you know. But again, I'm sorry that it bothered you. And I know in the future. And she and I never had to talk about it again, kept it moving. Other people aren't comfortable with that. Mm-hmm. And so when you work with me, you have to be willing to kind of be in that uncomfortable space at, as this process goes, because it's just the part of the business and it's not personal. Right. Oh, that's excellent. So we can't keep everybody hanging any longer. How did you help Shonda Ryan? Okay. It's, it, it's so, it, I didn't think it was a big deal at the time. I read this script and it was by a writer that n- no one knew at the time. I thought her writing was outstanding. We had two projects where I needed to find writers on. I went to my boss, begged and pleaded, and they decided that she was an outstanding writer as well. And her name is Shonda Rhimes. It was really, I am telling you, I didn't think about that moment again until I watched her career just blossom. So how it's, long ago was that? I, I mean, you're, I'm talking like 30 years ago. I mean, this is long before she was Shonda Rhimes. Wow. And I doubt if Shonda has a clue, like, I don't even know if the deal ever went through with Disney animation, but I bet you she would be like, who's Karen Kaufman? Because <laughs> trust me, Shonda Rhimes was, went on to make her success all on her own. <laughs> That's right. And she was but Michael Jackson bad. I knew she was a talent. I knew she was a, a talent. Wow. Wow. She was Michael Jackson bad way back then. Right. Look, and look, I saw the Jackson five when they opened for the Ohio players. So, okay. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes it just, it just, you just get a chance to see it early. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's a terrific share. So what 
about the work that you do get you up in the morning? You know, I long, I long to make projects that make people think and feel and contemplate and talk about and because I've had movies and TV uh, TV shows that have had a definite impact on the way I view the world. And I hope one day to make something like that. And you have to cut your teeth on something that's a little more commercial, like lust and envy with hopes that one day you'll make something that has a real, you know, like the Selmas of the world where it just has a huge impact. Yeah. And so that's a good place. So what is the goal to uh, produce a, a film like like an I don't know if it has to be Selma, but for example, I there were, you know, movies that were made, you know, the postman rings twice that are classic thrillers that I would love to be a part of making something that withstands the test of time when I I I'm very good friends with a director named Ted Witcher. And when he was making Love Jones, trust me, he didn't know that Love Jones was going to be the quintessential Black romance movie. Mm -hmm. When I was a, an assistant in post-production on Boomerang with Reggie Hudlin, I did not know that Boomerang was going to be an iconic comedy. I, I don't think you know when it's happening, but gosh, what a great thing to have happen if you do it right. Yeah, that's excellent. And what would you say to uh, Black or African American uh, people trying to break into the TV or film industry? Any tip, any advice? Read, 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 watch, watch, watch. Read, any chance you can get your hands on a pilot. Um, and oftentimes you can actually Google it online and you can get copies of pilots that, and I don't mean just black pilots, any pilots, you know, from Breaking Bad to Ted Lasso to whatever is, you know, really strong material. Keep reading really good material because you'll start to see this, you'll, you'll start to see trends in those works. Like why, oh, this dialogue is really crisp. Oh, and this one, they really captured the mood or whatever it is, you'll start to see what good writing looks like. Once you've seen good writing, you're a different person. It changes your whole perspective about what you're writing because you'll have to say, gosh, would, would, I, would the person feel like this if they read my material? So I really encourage people to like, don't, don't listen to friends in your circle. They don't know. They don't know. Mm -hmm. Go outside of your circle and read other material. Excellent advice. And, you know, with so much going on, I know last year during the pandemic, you were busy, but how do you give back? And is being part of the solution today important to you? It's really important to me. It's very, very important to me. And the way that I try to give back, like I am very focused right now on exploring young Black female writers because I have this open door at Lifetime where I can go to them, you know, with ideas. I am very focused on trying to keep uh, those kinds of opportunities like I was able to provide for the writer of Envy. Neka Gersel had written a script. I thought it was great. I spoke to her agent. We were looking for a writer on Envy. He said, you really should use her. And I actually said, I don't know if she'll respond to this material. Well, she did. And now I'm working with her on a second project. It gives me so much pleasure to have given her, been able to help her get her first job as a TV writer. And in turn, she'll always feel a sense of gratitude to me. And it's just, I'm so excited to see that happening. And so right now that's my focus. I am really looking for, you know, maybe they're a story editor on a TV show or something. They may not have a lot of experience, but I might be able to sell them up at Lifetime. Love it. 
And in terms of people connecting with you, are you on Clubhouse? And if so, what's your handle? I am on Clubhouse. I am just starting to kind of, you know, put my toe in the Clubhouse world, which has really been interesting. I, it's just, it's like something I've never quite seen before. And I really enjoyed it. It's fabulous. And for someone with you, with the experience and expertise, Oh, wow. People would, uh, you know how you say, uh, sit at your feet. They would sit in your room <laughs> and, and glean. <laughs> yeah, I, I I really found it to be really interesting. And I love the, the vast amount of different subjects. Yes, yes. I love it. So well, what is your handle? How can they reach you on Clubhouse? It's at Karen Kaufman. I don't think it's Karen Kaufman Wilson. I think it's at Karen Kaufman. Okay, okay. And do you host any clubs yet or do you? Have I haven't room? because like I said, I'm so new to the process. I have to, I'm, I'm, t- I'm kind of playing with an idea. I haven't quite worked it out. Okay. I haven't we'll quite we'll stay tuned. Out. Okay. <laughs> and uh, how would someone reach out to you uh, other than Clubhouse? Um, my email address is at K-K-W-G-E-N-E. Dot, um, at gmail.com. So I can be reached that way. I will tell you that I will be honest and say, I'm not going to be able to talk to you for like two weeks because I've got a lot of other things that I'm trying to get done. Sure. Um, and I will, you know, and I will pay attention if you listen to this interview and you write me and you ask me for something. If That's you make right. that mistake, I will probably delete your email. <laughs> Well, you guys heard it. That's probably the most valuable tip in this interview. And as I always say in closing, remember, be a game changer. The world has enough players. Thanks for listening to Business Innovators Radio. To hear all episodes featuring leading industry influencers and trendsetters, visit us online at businessinnovatorsradio.com today.